We are moving on to yet another organ, which is also sometimes called the second brain, the gut. And Orit has chosen to work on this giant organ to keep you busy for the next 20 years to come, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah hopefully. So, we're looking forward to this. Oh, no, but it's... So you get to see all my talk before I even start. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, it's really nice to be here in Barcelona today, and I really want to thank the uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk. And what I'm going to mostly focus on today is um, figuring out how to actually collect data in a good way for... Um, for the HCA roadmap, and I'm going to give you a practical example because I think this always helps a little bit. Um, and I'm going to focus on the small intestine and the colon, on the gut, which is, we found out is a huge organ. Um, and I really hope that actually this will be helpful for um, other people that are working on other organs uh, in, in the sense that it will create some sort of framework that other people can use. So the goal of the uh, HCA roadmap is actually to generate a comprehensive plan to sample each organ or system to ensure that the samples collected represent all the tissue's cellular diversity and that they are coherent with each other such that the uh, atlas that results from that can be replicated among individuals as well as profiling sites, which is quite a big task overall. So how can we do this? Well, first we need to know what are our sample sources? Where do we get our organs from? Then we need to know what are the anatomical landmarks of each one of these organs. We need to know what are the histological structures in these organs, and also what are the cellular profiles, and what molecular information do we actually need? So how can we actually do this in a systematic way for the small intestine and colon? Well, as Aviv said, we didn't know how huge the gut is. We also didn't know a lot of other things. So we actually partnered with the Helmsley Charitable Trust and also with Romney Xavier and Moshe uh, Beaton, as well as the whole gut uh, cell atlas planning working group in order to better understand these organs. And overall, we came with an approach where we figure out what the anatomical landmarks are of these organs, and then we take specific sample types, so I'll go into the sample types soon, and we look at specific histological structures, and then we perform uh, molecular measurements as well as cellular measurements. We take all the data and integrate it. Well, working with the gut poses some uh, challenges and has some advantages in terms of challenges. We all know that we are of different height and different diets, so we expect our gut to be somewhat different uh, in, in, in length and uh, size. There are uh, specialized cells in the gut, and they also go along a continuum. There are different regions, both anatomical and histological regions, which is really important to uh, take into account. Uh, the, the tissue itself or the organ undergoes rapid uh, degradation once you take it out of the uh, individual, so we have to be very uh, time efficient with that. It's underdeveloped in pediatrics, so we really need to see if, if it's uh, what state it's at. Um, and there are all kinds of what we call risk factors, meaning do you have any challenges? Did you eat a, a hamburger, which is not very healthy? Uh, what's your circadian rhythm? Like if you came to Barcelona from West Coast, I think it's pretty off. So um, the, the two main uh, advantages are that you can actually, um, they're not used for organ transplantation, so you have quite a lot of tissue, and also they're used as biopsies. Uh, after the age of 50, you get uh, a, a biopsy, so we have plenty of tissue. Okay, so what sample sources do we have? So we're thinking of focusing on three major types of, um, of samples. So the first one is a biopsy. 
So the, the advantages of a biopsy is that it's taken from a living, usually healthy uh, individual. Uh, however, you can't get all the um, histological layers in most cases when you do a biopsy. Uh, resection is also pretty good, um, but you need to know that before resection, first of all, patients are prepped in a specific way, which they're not prepped, for example, when you do organ donation. And also, in most cases, resections come from, even though they're supposedly healthy, they come from individuals that suffer from uh, disease such as cancer and so forth. But it's kind of nice to compare between the biopsy, the resection, and also if we get tissue from organ donors, in this case, you get, you know, the whole tissue, which is, gives you an opportunity to look at all the layers and, uh, and the anatomical structures, but you didn't, as I said, it degrades quickly, so some of the anatomical landmarks won't be seen um, quite well if you're not quick enough. Um, in addition, it will be nice to have a microbiome from some of these uh, samples to go along, as well as organoids, which we would like to sample as well. So we think that a blend of all of these sample types would be very informative. No source is perfect, as I said, but together we think that they complement each other pretty well. So what are the anatomical landmarks? Uh, so for the small intestine, there are main three anatomical uh, regions, the ileum, jejunum, and duodenum. And for the colon, there are five, starting with uh, the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, oops, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and sigmoid colon. So where do we want to sample? So for uh, the small intestine, starting with the duodenum, we want to do the duodenum bulb, the second descending part, and also, importantly, we want to look in between these two uh, landmarks. For the geogenum, we'll do the proximal, the middle, and the distal. And for the ilium, immediately proximal to the ileocecal valve, and 6 to 12 centimeters proximal to the, to the valve, and also between the two landmarks. And importantly, we think we should take two samples from each of these parts to make sure that we account for continuums that are possible there. For the um, colon, we will take uh, two pieces from the ascending column, transverse column, descending column, sigmoid column, and the rectum. Again, to account for these continuums of cells. So next we want to know what are the histological structures in these uh, organs. So if we look at the small intestine, there are four such histological structures. There is the mucosa the submucosa, where, for example, the enteric uh, nervous system or the neurons are, which is really important. Um, there's the muscularis and the serosa. So if, for example, we focus on the mucosa, we know that the cells are organized along a crypt uh, villi axis, and these cells vary by their position in these crypts. And you might think that, you know, if I have two crypts which are close to each other, They'll be very similar, which might be, but first of all, the cells in them are different, and also if you take crypts along the, you know, some of these, the small intestine is quite long, they might be different, so we really need to uh, account for that, because the cells, uh, their programs and their proportions might change along this uh, axis. So for the colon, uh, we again have these four layers. Uh, in the mucosa, the cells are organized a little bit differently. They only have the crypts. And again, we have this uh, uh, idea where uh, each histological structure, the cells can vary uh, in terms of their position and composition along the colon, the different areas. Okay, so which cellular profiles and which molecular information do we actually need in order to sample? Well, we think we need uh, uh, at least three of them. Uh, the first one would be anatomical histological, so we propose to do, for example, CT and MRI. We also will do an H&E stain for histology for each one of these. Um, and we can also do MRI followed by H&E to really allow for deep registration. In terms of molecular profiling, we can do single cell or single nucleus RNA sequencing, single cell atac -seq. Um, and, you know, additional methods that come up and are robust. 
Uh, we would also like to do some bulk analysis. For example, bulk whole exome sequencing or bulk uh, whole genome sequencing will be helpful if we decide to do um, uh, GWAS studies. And bulk RNA sequencing, of course, is important to know what the proportions uh, are of, of the different cell types and also helps quite a lot with annotation. In terms of spatial profiling, we recommend to do at least one multiplex in situ RNA method and one multiplex protein method. Okay, so this is all great, but we also need to know how many individuals, how many cells, and how many fields of view or regions we actually need to look at. So in terms of individuals, we think of profiling adults, which will be somewhere between 20 to 70, as well as pediatric samples, which will be uh, birth to 18. Uh, of course, uh, uh, profile both men and women uh, from uh, different ethnic, genetic, and uh, geographic uh, locations in order to get diversity. In terms of number of cells, we would like to look at least at cells that are present at 0.5% frequency overall. And wh what we suggest is actually to pool the information across all the, vin the individuals that we sample in order for us to find what we call rare cells. We can also use depletion and enrichment methods to look for the rare cells or cells that we're really interested in. And we can also decide that for a specific region, we just profile a really large number of cells in order to see them. And the idea here is also to multiplex samples from the get-go and then use either the genetics or uh, different hashing uh, protocols in order to, um, to parse them out. In terms of fields of view, so you, know, you take a, a, a region and then you further subdivide it by using anatomical gridding uh, into voxels, and we suggest taking from this grid about three voxels from areas that are a little bit different uh, from each other. And one thing that's really important to remember is also to make sure to bank samples because you never know when the, you know, the new, new technology uh, that everyone wants to use will come out. So this is really important. So how do we actually uh, generate this sort of atlas? How do we generate a deep and generalizable uh, uh, approach? So we actually take a three-pronged approach. Uh, the first phase is what we call the pilot phase. And here the idea is that you actually, you don't profile a huge number of individuals, but what you do is you benchmark your methods and your sample sources, and you compare and see how they work. And you use both healthy adult and pediatric uh, samples for this. The second phase is, we call it the depth phase. And here what you do is you profile tissues in really greater depth from a smaller number of individuals. So you use a lot of technologies, you profile a lot of cells, and a lot of anatomical tiles. And this will actually serve for the, uh, as a ground for the third, uh, uh, what we call the breadth uh, phase, where we sort of increase the number of individuals, because from phase two, we actually learned what are the methods and how deep we need to go. So here we can use a lot more individuals with less uh, methods overall. And this would be very helpful when we do GWAS studies and so forth, when you, where you really need a large number of individuals. So um, our community has been very busy, and you saw in Aviv's and Sarah talk that there are really nice results from the gut cell atlas. So people have been collecting across uh, adults and pediatrics and the different uh, sample types, the biopsies, resections, and from organ donors using different sample processing uh, as well as profiling uh, for spatial. And so overall, the community has uh, profiled 131 individuals across 216 samples and about almost 1.35 million cells, which I think is really, really impressive. It's a very vibrant community. And they've been doing this across healthy tissues. So here you can see an example from a study where uh, there is, uh, the question was actually to look at uh, um, a cell type that previously was pretty hard to, to look at when we uh, use single cell RNA sequencing. Here we use single cell RNA, single nucleus RNA sequencing to actually 
uh, profile the neurons in, in the colon. And we, uh, the community is also looking at the small intestine and health and disease. There are several labs who are doing that. They're looking at response to therapy, which is also very exciting. And these were all uh, Crohn's, and we're also looking at UC. Um, I think something that's really important and um, a really burgeoning, burgeoning uh, field is now the um, spatial analysis, and uh, the community has been using different methods for both spatial uh, transcriptomics and proteomics um, to look at, at the gut, and I think we'll see a lot more results in, in our next meeting, so this is all really nice. So we think that having uh, a gut cell atlas, both of the colon and small intestine, will actually give us a lot of information about the healthy tissue and a lot of insight into their biology, and this is very exciting, but it would also help us really understand disease. It will serve as a reference, and this will allow us to ask where disease uh, risk genes act, which cells are disrupted because of this, what cell programs are changed as a result, what are their functions and modules, which communications between cells are disrupted, and what is the effect of the drug. And with this, I would like to thank all the numerous people that helped with, uh, with this, these uh, amazing projects. So Aviv, Jenny, uh, Anya, Kristen, uh, Rahul, and uh, John worked with us on the HCA roadmap in general. Romnik, uh, Moshe, and Chris Smiley, as well as uh, Garabet and Jessica from the uh, Helmsley really helped us a lot to think uh, about the um, roadmap for the gut. And uh, there are a lot of people um, from the gut community that are listed here from the gut biological network. So thank you. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Orit. What a fascinating project. Questions to Orit. There's one in the, or two in the very back. John. So the community here has made tremendous progress. Um, when will you know when you're finished? <laughs> I think uh, that's a quaff, tough question, and, and I, I think, you know, it, I think it will we'll be in phases, and hopefully uh, we'll finish in our lifetime soon. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think I can say when we'll ever finish and where we'll, when we'll find the most rare cell ever uh, that we didn't find uh, previously. But I think we're making a lot of uh, progress. So, um, And Aviv, maybe you want to. I think this is, in, in this case, more like a, just for cell rarity. I think it's not a question of finishing. It's a question of achieving a pre-stated uh, percent. So, so you have to say, I want to know that I've seen cells that are present at this rarity. There might be rarer cells. You need to appreciate that they might exist, and you need a, you know, statistical confidence that they're there or not. I think the bigger issue with these big organs that, you know, unlike the brain, they don't have a, too much, uh, you know, extremely fine substructure. They, they seem very repetitive, is that that's why you have to sample from different places and see are you seeing anything that's different. And again, it's kind of a power analysis type of thing. Are you seeing things you haven't seen before? And if you haven't, it doesn't mean you've finished. It just means that you've saturated what you can get. And we have to come to terms with that type of thinking, in my, in my view at least. So we, we put it at 0.5% uh, okay. for now. So. Yeah. There was another question in the back and then at... Uh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, so it's related actually to this discussion. So uh, um, you talked about power analysis. Mm -hmm. So do you actually formally try to do some analysis to check how many patients do I need to find the cell that's 0.1% uh, of all cell types or to detect the difference? So we're working copies. on that now for several different systems. I think um, we'll know that pretty soon. Um, and there, there are, like if you go on Rahul Satija's website, there is a, a little uh, program that tells you how many samples you actually need to sample in order to see a cell in this type of rarity. But I think we need to have uh, a lot, well, we need to have more data in order to say that uh, in a good way. 
So final question or comment from Ed. Yeah, I guess yeah. I just wanted to, to say, you know, I think it's not just about type. It's also about sort of organizational principles like gradients. Mm. Yes. And for a very long organ, yes. you can imagine that a lot of this is a canonical architecture that mm -hmm. varies somewhat over space, with perhaps some steps in it. Right? And cortex in the brain is like that as well. It's very much like that, but it, it becomes very important because when people try to align their data, if they didn't get it from the same part, it doesn't align well. Mm -hmm. So part of, it seems, getting a comprehensive understanding of the gut is understanding the nature of that gradient. Yeah. 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 Final words I'll to Avif, word one yeah. sentence. <laughs> um, first of all, we know that already, even from studies of the mouse small intestine that were done several years ago, that there is a gradient, and some of it is compositional, so some cells you really don't see in some regions. Um, and some of it is really continue, uh, just a continuum in, in, in the programs of the cells. So they have some things that are shared between them, and just like we see in the brain. So that's, again, a question of how do you sample so you know you know the car right the characteristics of the gradient and the right parameters, you, you're not going to do it continuously. That's going to be a fool's errand. So I think that's what we are going to gradually see. But for example, for the enteric neurons, we've seen that there's actually quite discrete differences as well. So real compositional differences, some enteric neurons in some places and not in others. We'll see, I think, over time. And I think that's why we did that specific design, right, where you go into uh, regions that you think will be different anatomically and you sample at least twice in regions that are a little bit different than each other. But this is the first, just the first one. Well, there seems to be an active interest in this discussion. If you want to continue, there will be a breakout ah, yes. session uh, in the afternoon, and so don't miss that one yes. if you're interested in the gut.